The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty Father, whose most dear Son, on the night before he suffered, instituted the sacrament of his body and blood, mercifully grant that we may receive it in thankful remembrance of Jesus Christ, our Saviour, who in these holy mysteries gives us a pledge of eternal life, and who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Standing, hear these commandments which God has given to his people and take them to heart. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods but me. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not bow down to any graven image. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not take the name of the Lord in vain. Lord, have mercy upon us and guide our hearts to keep this law. Remember the Lord's day and keep it holy. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. Honor your father and your mother Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not commit murder. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not commit adultery. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not steal. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not bear false witness. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not covet anything. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolve to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all men. Please kneel as you are able to. Let us confess our sins to Almighty God. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our fellow man in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Let us receive God's forgiveness. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We continue to remain healing as we pray the collect for Ash Wednesday. Almighty and everlasting God, you hate nothing that you have made, and you forgive the sins of all who are penitent. Create and make in us new and contrite hearts, that lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness, we may receive from you the God of all mercy, perfect forgiveness and peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Collect for Monday Thursday together. Almighty God, whose Son, Jesus Christ, has taught us that what we do for the least of our brethren, we do also for him. Give us the will to be the servant of others, as he was the servant of all, who gave up his life and died for us, yet is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
Please be seated for the reading of scripture. The New Testament reading is taken from Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 to 8. This may be found on page 345 of the New Testament portion found in the Bible in the pew. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Let's please stand for the gradual hymn, A New Commandment. The Holy Gospel is written in the 13th chapter of the Gospel according to St. John, beginning at the first verse. Glory, Glory to Christ our Savior. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and, taking a tower, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet 
and to wipe them with the tower that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, The one who has bathed does not need to wash, except for his feet, but it is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, Not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have loved for one another. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise, Praise to Christ, Christ our Lord. Please be seated. This evening, it is our joy to welcome Deaconess Bessie Lee to bring God's word. I think for many of us, Deaconess Bessie is no stranger to us, having served here at St. Andrew's Cathedral for over 35 years before being posted and to be a blessing at St. John's St. Margaret's Church. But this evening, uh, let's put our hands together to welcome home and welcome back Deaconess Bessie. Good evening. Good evening and thank you very much for your kindness. It's wonderful to be back. Um, may we bow for a word of prayer. Father, we ask that as we dwell in your presence now, that your Holy Spirit may hover over this gathering. And we ask that the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all our hearts be acceptable and pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Friends, it's the last night before Jesus Christ dies. And Jesus knows that his time on this earth would soon be up. Now up to this point in time, 
He has been ministering to all kinds of people, but mainly in public. But tonight, there is a marked shift in his focus. Tonight, in the upper room, away from the crowds, Jesus spends time alone with his own disciples. He speaks intimately with them, and the spotlight falls on two disciples. Peter, who would soon deny Jesus three times before the cock crows, and Judas Iscariot, who for 30 pieces of silver would betray Jesus this very night. Tonight, in the upper room, Jesus shows his disciples the full extent of his love. So the Bible says, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. So friends, for us on this evening of the most intimate of Christian holy days, if you are Christ's own, if you belong to Jesus Christ, then would you receive all that Jesus said and did to his disciples as said and done to you in a very personal and loving way? Now, in the time of Jesus, most people traveled on foot, and the custom was such that on arrival, guests would have their dusty, muddy feet washed. Hospitality involved offering a basin of water, usually placed at the door. Guests would also be treated to the services of the servants. So the second lowest slave of the household would untie the sandals of the guests, and the lowest slave would wash their feet. But that night in the upper room, the disciples started to eat with unwashed feet because there was no one to do the job and none of them were willing to stoop so low. So as the meal got underway, Jesus gets up from the supper table. He removes his outer clothing so he is stripped down to a loin cloth. He wraps a towel around his waist, takes a basin of water, and he stoops down to wash the feet of his disciples. Friends, the master becomes the servant. God has placed all authority, all power, all things in the hands of his son. Yet Jesus stoops to pick up a towel and a basin. So naturally, the disciples were appalled. So one of them, Peter, he blurts out to Jesus, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. What did Jesus mean? Friends, when you turn from your sinful ways, whether it be a long time ago or even this very night, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ and acknowledge him as your savior and your Lord, you are washed clean in your sins. God bathes you in salvation and you are brought into a union with Jesus Christ. And friends, this is a settled relationship that cannot change. Jesus said, if I do not wash you, 
you have no share with me. Strong words. And Jesus, without whom nobody can come to God, found it necessary to say these words on his last night with his disciples. So critical it is that one should be washed that Simon Peter then said to Jesus, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. So when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, every sin is dealt with and there is no need to repeat this act of repentance and faith. However, as we live in this world, as we journey along, we still pick up dirt and filth. We do wrong. We fail to do right. And this sin tarnishes our relationship with God. So there is a need for us to regularly confess our sins and to receive God's forgiveness. Now in the Old Testament, this truth is illustrated in the instructions for the appointment and the ministry of the priests. At his consecration, the priest was bathed all over from top to toe. It was a one-time event. But daily, he had to wash his hands and his feet at the laver or a basin that is outside the temple courtyard. And only then could he enter the holy place. Only then could he offer sacrifices of worship that would be acceptable to God. Therefore, when we come to God, whether it be alone in prayer or all together at a church service like this, we begin with confession. Hyper grace is a teaching which is in error. Hyper grace emphasizes the grace of God to the exclusion of the other vital teachings such as the regular confession of sin. Hyper grace says that all sin, past, present, and future, has already been forgiven. So there is no need for a believer to ever confess it again. But in contrast, the scripture in 1 John 1 and verses 8 and 9 that is built into our Christian liturgy today says, friends, let's read this all together. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So our communion with Jesus Christ depends on us keeping ourselves unstained from the world. Friends, we cannot come fully into the presence of a holy God if we allow unconfessed sin to stay with us. So tonight, as we hear Jesus speak so closely with Peter, may we also hear him speak to us. Jesus said, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Friends, are you washed? You know, through the years that I worshipped in this beautiful cathedral, with its great uh, people, church people, 
I cannot remember a single year when there was not a foot washing service. Every year in preparation for this special service, quite a lot of consideration is given to the selection of the 12 people who should have their feet washed by the bishop. Should they be men or women, boys and girls? Should they be the leaders of the church representing the different ministries? Or should they be ordinary members, perhaps even the ones who are usually late for church service and always asleep during the sermon? In the upper room that night, Jesus washed the feet of all his disciples, and they were a motley crew. He washed the feet of John, the one who was closest to him. He washed the feet of Thomas, doubting Thomas. He washed the feet of Matthew, formerly the people's hated tax collector, and of Peter, the impulsive one, the one who often spoke and acted before he thought. And despite the fact that he knew that Judas Iscariot would betray him, Jesus washed his feet. Can you for a moment imagine how Judas must have felt, especially when their eyes met? Was he nervous? Was he scared? Did he feel shame and guilt? Well, we don't know. And if he did, it didn't show. Jesus knew Judas's traitor heart, but no one else in that room had any idea. How come? Because there was no rejection. There was no calling out. There was no condemnation. That night, the upper room was charged with love. Jesus loved his own to the end. He loved Judas to the uttermost. Even the seating arrangement at the supper table showed his love. You know, there's a centuries-old mural painting in a dining hall of one of the Christian convents in Italy. And the painting is entitled, The Last Supper. And the one who painted it was the artist Leonardo da Vinci. So it's very famous, and many people today would travel great distances just to see this beautiful piece of art. And there, painted, Jesus and his disciples are seated at table. However, based on Jewish tradition, the Passover feast that they were celebrating and most other meals were such that people would not be seated on chairs. In fact, they would be reclined around a low table, perhaps like the one that you see on the screen. Each person would be lying on his side, head facing the table, feet away from it. And although the Bible does not directly state the seating arrangement for this supper, we can deduce from it where Judas Iscariot, where Jesus, where the disciple John and Peter had to have sat. So Jesus was the host of this meal, and Judas got to sit next to him, on his left, at the place designated for the most honored guest. Jesus showed Judas a special honor he reached out to Judas that night. He loved him to the end. During the meal, Jesus was troubled in his spirit, and he said to his disciples, 
Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And when he was asked who he meant, Jesus answered, it is he whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas. Now in the culture of that time, to take bread and then to dip it in the common dish and then to offer it to a person indicates a very special friendship. So with his unbelieving heart set on betraying the Lord, Judas took the bread, he ate it, and the Bible says that then Satan entered him. Jesus gave Judas his hand of friendship, even though he knew that he would betray him. Jesus himself had earlier on said, the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. You know, to lift one's heel, showing the bottom of one's foot to another, was then a sign of contempt, a sign of hatred. Jesus knew that of Judas, that Judas would give him this horse kick. Friends, this part of the narrative begs the question, question that is often asked. Since Judas's betrayal was known to God, question is, did Judas actually have a choice in the matter? Now, we would find it hard to understand God's foreknowledge in this matter because you and I exist in time. You and I see time as a straight line. We experience time in linear fashion. So we remember the past and we are not able to see the future coming up. But God exists out of time. He created everything even before time began. So God sees every moment in time as the present. Therefore, while God foreknew that Judas would betray Jesus, the Bible makes it clear that Judas was responsible for the betrayal. It was a deliberate premeditated act on his part, at least up to the point where he took the bread. And as soon as he took the bread, the Bible says, Satan entered him. At this point, Judas committed his soul to suicide. Later on, remorseful, yet not willing to repent of his sin, he hanged himself. So Judas was a victim, yes, but a victim of his own rejection of Jesus' hand of friendship. So the case of Judas Iscariot is very tragic. It shows us that a person can come so close to the Savior and yet be lost forever. Judas had been with the Lord Jesus since the beginning of his ministry. He was counted as a disciple, in fact, highly regarded, so he was the treasurer. So friends, as we come to the Lord's Supper, this evening, may we know that the Lord Jesus Christ is here. He knows you, and he knows me, and he knows us at our worst. And he still gives us his hand of friendship.
this very night. Now, after Judas Iscariot left the supper that night, Jesus began to give his final instructions to the remaining disciples. And he said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. But what's new about this commandment? You know, the command to love other people, isn't it already there in the Old Testament? In Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 18, God said, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But now it is new because Jesus commanded his disciples not simply to love, but to love one another as he has loved them. Therefore, what is new is that Jesus is now the pattern for us to live out love. And to carry out his command, we would need to follow his example. In the upper room that night, Jesus demonstrated his love. The master served his disciples. The teacher, his students. Jesus took the last place. He did the dirty job. And he set for us an example of humility and service. Service that is not spectacular. Service that is in the ordinary but service that is practical, essential, radical. And he said, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. So friends, these are hard words, very hard words, but they are not hollow words. For here, what Jesus promised, he said, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. So is it ever possible for us to have this love for one another in the family of God? Don't you think and agree with me that some of the hardest people to love and to serve are Christians in the church? Some of you are nodding. So we would rather be serving people in the community out there than our own fellow believers in the church. As Charlie Brown once said to Lucy, I love mankind. It's people I can't stand. Jesus said, by this, all people will know you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Let's take a leaf from history. This is three centuries after the death of Jesus Christ. In that time, Christianity had grown and become the dominant and official religion of the Roman Empire. Belief in Jesus Christ, a mere Jewish carpenter, sentenced to die on the cross, crucifixion being the most painful form of Roman execution and reserved only for slaves and criminals, very seldom applied to Roman citizens, that faith in Jesus Christ spread throughout the great empire. How did that happen? Historians say that it was mainly due to the impression that the Christian community had on society. The believers, or rather the unbelievers in that time, had this to say about the Christians, and this is recorded in history, secular history. See, how these love one another. 
So society could not understand how people from diverse backgrounds, different races, different gender, different social economic status could love one another. So this visible love between members of the Christian community, the church, this new way of life, new way of living, appealed to many in the empire. Today, what is the first thing that comes to mind when people think of Christians? What is the first thing that people think of when it comes to you and me and our Christian church? And what would it take for them to be drawn to the message of the gospel? You know, much of our world today, especially with the internet, the world has heard the message of God's love. And the world has heard that God is love. But the evidence that is weighing in the balance is not our words, it is our conduct. So possibly the greatest gift that we can give the world is for us in the church to love one another. So difficult. How do we love one another? How should we speak to one another? How should we speak of one another? How can we forgive one another? How can we serve one another? You know, Jesus did not say that night that he was giving us a recommendation or that he was making a suggestion that we should love other people. He did not give us a choice. The Bible says he gave us a command. He issued that command on the night he instituted the communion. This was to commemorate the new covenant, the new agreement, the new contract which he ratified with his own blood shed on the cross. Friends, in this new covenant, God promised to enable his people to carry out his commands. And he would do this by transforming by changing their hearts and their minds. It's there in Ezekiel chapter 36. Let's read together verses 26 and 27. God said, And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. So friends, with the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, with the coming of the Holy Spirit, you and I, who are in Jesus Christ, the Bible says, can carry out this command to love one another. We have a promised help in the power of the Holy Spirit whom God has put within each one of us. So this evening we will soon come to the Lord's table and many of us here will be partaking of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ through which we enter into the new covenant. Question is, as you receive the elements, what would it mean for you? Friends, to whom and for what shall we gather this evening? Monday Thursday takes its name from a root word in Latin called mondatum. Mondatum means commandment. So Monday Thursday 
is really Commandment Thursday. It's not the Thursday where we should be weepy. It's Commandment Thursday. So it's the evening where we draw near to Jesus who loves us and who gave his life for us. And as we eat the bread and drink of the cup of the new covenant, may we pledge our obedience to this new commandment and receive again God's grace, God's power, God's enablement to love one another even as Christ has loved us. May we bow and pause for a little while as we settle in our hearts how we would like to obey this commandment of the Lord tonight. Should there be faces or names of people flashed before you, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ who have wronged us, and that wrong has been for so long now, know that the Lord is reaching out to you tonight to help you settle that so that afresh in this new year we can draw near to the God of all grace and mercy. Amen. We thank Deaconess Bessie for bringing God's words to us this evening to remind us on this Monday Thursday to love one another, that the world will know we are his disciples. Will you stand with me for our off preparatory hymn? Common Praise 601. Common Praise 601. Thou didst leave thy throne. At the same time, I invite the representatives for the feet washing to come forward and take your stations.
On the night before his death, Jesus set an example for his disciples by washing their feet, an act of humble service. He taught that strength and growth in the life of the kingdom of God come not by worldly power and authority, but such lowly service. Amen. Congregation, you may be seated. John chapter 13, verses 18 to 30, and verses 36 to 38. I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen. But the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I am telling you this now, before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, Whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at the table at Jesus' side. So Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So that disciple, leaning back against Jesus, said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, What are you going to do? Do quickly. Now no one at the table knew why he said this to him. Some thought that Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him. By what you need for the feast or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out. And it was night. Verse 36. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, Where I am going, you cannot follow me now. But you will follow afterwards. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, Will you lay down your life for me? 
Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times.
Let us continue to come before the Lord. When he had washed their feet and put on his clothes again, he went back to the table and he said to his disciples, If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. Let us pray together. O Lord Jesus Christ, enthroned in the majesty of heaven, when you came forth from God, you made yourself a servant. We adore you because you laid aside the garment of your glory, girded yourself with lowest humility, and ministered to your disciples, washing their feet. Teach us to know what you have done and to follow your example. Deliver us from pride, jealousy, and ambition, and with lowliness to serve one another for your sake. O oh, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Jesus says, A new commandment I give to you. Love one another. We hear that, we obey. By this shall the world know that you are my disciples, that you love one another. Good evening, brothers and sisters, and welcome to St. Andrew's Cathedral on this Monday Thursday service. If you are here with us for the first time, we would like to acknowledge your presence. If you are here could, for the first time, could you just raise your hand as we have a little gift for you? Anyone here for the first time, could you just raise your hands? Welcome. If anyone else is here for the first time, continue keeping your hands up so that ushers can come with a gift pack. Thank you and welcome again. I would like to take this time to run us through some announcements. Uh, firstly, it's regarding our services over the next three days. Uh, we invite all of you to join us. Um, and our service on Good Friday, Holy Saturday, and Easter Sunday. Do take note of the timings. On Good Friday, that's tomorrow, our service begins at 8 a.m. On Saturday, we also have a combined service, a Holy Saturday service at 4 p.m. On Easter Sunday, we will be having two Easter celebrations. At dawn service, is at 8 a.m., and then we have a combined service at 8 a.m. So we invite, uh, encourage all of us to come together uh, to worship and to celebrate the victory Christ has achieved on the cross. And lastly, uh, please take note that at the end of the service, this church lights will be switched off. You'll be walking out in darkness, so be careful as you make your way out of the nave. If you drive, uh, please be aware that the gates will be closed after 30 minutes after, at the end of the service. And this is all the announcement I have for us this evening. May I invite all of us to rise together for the peace. Thanks. We are the body of Christ. In the spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Let us then pursue all that makes for peace and builds up our common life. The peace of the Lord be with you. Also with you. Shall we greet one another with the peace of the Lord? The Lord be with you. Bless you. Our offertory hymn is found in the Hymns of Praise 378. Hymns of Praise 378, My Saviour's Love.
is come from you and of your glory to we give you. Amen.
you far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ for thee live his risen life. We who drink this cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us. So we and all your children shall be free and the whole earth live to praise your name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Together we say, Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, so that you will love one another. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the world word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have sinned and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. But now when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. I have said these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering a service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. 
But I have said these things to you, that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. But now I'm going to him who sent me, and none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of the world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but now you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will speak, not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. And the Father, all the Father has is mine. Therefore I said, that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. A little while, and you will see me no longer. And again, a little while, you will see me. So some of his disciples said to one another, What is this that he says to us? A little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me. And because I am going to the Father, so they were saying, what does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he is talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him, so he said to them, is this what you are asking yourselves? What I meant by saying, a little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. And that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, I will give it to you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. And that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I come from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. His disciples said, Ah, now are you speaking plainly and not using figurative speech? Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come, when you will be scattered, 
each to his own home and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And they all left him and fled. <laughs> 